<clears throat> Thanks for joining everyone. Um, one thing I want to, the, the housekeeper I want to mention tonight is if you can go on mute during the presentation, that'd be welcome. Uh, we're going to take comments in the chat window. There's a chat section um, in Zoom. At the bottom, you'll see a little uh, bubble icon to chat. You can type your questions um, into that chat box. I'll be monitoring that as we go along. And once we have enough to pause and ask uh, Chuck questions, I'll read them off to him. Uh, otherwise, Chuck will be, we'll keep going through his presentation. Um, <clears throat> before we start the presentation, I just want to let everyone know because things have been kind of in a state of flux with COVID. Uh, the Society will be having an annual, in-person annual symposium, symposium this year. Um, the details are just being finalized now. Uh, there will be an email blast going out on it. And I think we're going to be sending out a, a flyer in the mail. Um, so the next diamond is going to press. It's actually going to print in about a day or two. So it's too late to get it in there. So we'll probably have to do a separate mailing. The, the uh, symposium this year will be in Hamburg, New York, uh, about 12 miles south of Buffalo on the BNSW line of the former Erie. Um, and uh, the symposium will be on Friday and Saturday, October 7th and 8th. So if you want to mark your calendars, those are the dates we have right now. Um, and that's what we've locked into. So um, let's begin. Um, I'd like to introduce our presenter. Uh, our presenter is Chuck Walsh. Uh, a historian and longtime supporter of passenger rail service improvements in New Jersey, particularly uh, the Lackawanna Cutoff. He's, a pres he's the president of the North Jersey Rail Commuter Association and is a co-founder of the Lackawanna Cutoff Historical Committee, a group which recently obtained a lease for the Lackawanna Greendale Station on the Cutoff. Since 2016, Chuck and his daughter Larissa have been creating videos for the Lackawanna Cutoff channel on YouTube, which will cover a wide variety of subjects related to the Cutoff. And I highly recommend you search it out. Um, I hate to use the term rabbit hole because it's negative, but this is a positive. Uh, the videos are all very well done. They're well produced. They're fairly lengthy. And once you watch one, you're going to get hooked and start watching the next one of the series. And there's, there's quite a few of them out there. I don't know the exact number. I guess Chuck can talk more about that. Um, so that's my little plug for Chuck's video channel. Um, but without any further ado, uh, Chuck Walsh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Paul. Uh, first of all, sound check. Uh, how am I doing here? Good. You're okay. Good. What I can do is put my presentation up. Okay. Well, it looks like my presentation went to the very beginning here. Some uh, uh, <laughs> news that. Uh, probably you've already seen about uh, Bill Bossert with the, uh, the MU going under the Delaware River Viaduct. I, and I don't know if it's the same thing from 35 years ago, but um, I captured this picture back, uh, this was at, uh, I think the EL um, convention in, in Buffalo, this was 85, I'm yeah. guessing, I'm not really sure. Do one or the other. That's the same. That's the same car, Chuck. It is. Okay, I was wondering about that. Okay, that was for my edification. <laughs> what? Can everyone please go on mute? Thank you. Alrighty. Okay. So, the lack of want to cut off. Uh, very topical because there has been some activity after a very long sabbatical. Uh, there's actually some activity which we'll talk about. Um, and even activity today with Amtrak. Um, so let's move on and- uh, oh, that, this, is ABC. this is ABC. Mute your phones. Okay. <laughs> All right, Here, uh, here's the, the overview of the presentation. Um, first of all, I'm gonna do an intro to the Lackawanna Cutoff, which is basically a short <laughs> slide presentation. No. I'll also talk about yours truly. Uh, the next thing will be why the cutoff was built. Next after that, uh, the construction of the line and the line. 
Randy, mute yourself. And then we'll do a, the cutoff through the decades of which would be a chronological discussion of the, the cutoff. And then we'll do the questions and answers. Although Paul, you've indicated we might, you can interrupt me if, you've, if there's some compelling question which comes up. The, the Lackawanna, when the cutoff open, we'll talk about what the cutoff is for, I assume everyone does know what it is, but uh, I won't assume that necessarily. The, the cutoff when it opened in 1911, uh, became a marketing tool because it shortened the, the Lackawanna's main line by 11 miles. And it sort of sets the tone for how the, the cutoff will be treated over a long period of time. And something that we have picked on in, in the last 30 some odd years in terms of trying to promote it for restoration of service. And there you see the same photograph that was used for the Phoebe Snow poster. All right, looking at the cutoff, I'll go from basically east to west. Uh, broad view, it, it, we're basically looking at a line which is in northwestern New Jersey and just a smidgen of northeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, runs from Port Morris at Lake Apatcong to the Delaware Water Gap at Slateford Junction. And you'll see this map again, so I won't go into it in great deal right here, but there are three stations along the line. And a fourth was chooses to be uh, uh, to be added in by New Jersey Transit. So this goes back to before the cutoff actually existed, or at least is in the process of being built. And this is the where the Pequest Pequest fill will be. And actually, if you look right about here, this is where the Andover station stop for New Jersey Transit will be. Um, but none of that exists yet. Uh, they just started this cut here and the, the Peak West fill is, um, well, at least a year away in, at this location. The opposite end of the Peak West fill. I should move, let me just go back just for a second. I should point out where the Peak West fill is in terms of uh, the map right here. We'll be talking about the old road because we're actually talking about the history of the the line and well, to understand why the line was built, why the cutoff was built, you have to understand what was there prior to it being built. And uh, here's the old road in, in Oxford. You can see just by the way that the train curves that this is a, a sharp curve and there were lots of sharp curves on this line. One reason why it was replaced. The topography of Northwestern New Jersey created <clears throat> basically this cut and fill type of pattern for the cutoff. Uh, because of the fact that the cutoff went east-west, whereas the mountains or the hills went north-south, you would have cuts and then fills and cuts. Although the technology by today's standards are primitive and reflective of the time, very similar to what was being used for the Panama Canal at the time, uh, it was considered state-of-the-art at the time. The Roswell Tunnel, we'll be talking more about that, actually just at the very start of construction of the tunnel because it wasn't planned to be a tunnel from the very beginning. Delaware River Viaduct, uh, running obviously over the Delaware River in the uh, mid stages of construction. The Pollenskill Viaduct in Hainsburg. Those viaducts are only a couple of miles apart. They're very close together, relatively speaking. Um, a number of underpasses, which um, caused the Lackawanna a little bit of consternation because people complained about the fact that they were they thought they were too narrow or reflective of the day as well, that they would cause in some cases several, maybe a hundred or 150 yards of dry pull or dead pull during the winter when you had a horse drawn sleighs. Here they're demonstrating how wide the tunnel is, uh, but the, I don't know how many farmers were actually convinced of that because there were lots of complaints. Let me see, we'll see this photo again. This is um, Hainsburg siding in, uh, this is in Knowlton Township. 
This is in Blairstown, Molasses Junction. Lackawanna Limited at Port Morris Junction. And steam going eastbound on the cutoff, Blairstown, I believe. Phoebe Snow, uh, borrowed this from the RHS, and uh, it's a classic photo of the, the train going west from uh, the Polonsko Viaduct. And we'd be remiss not to talk about a little bit of freight, and here is probably NY100, eastbound at Slateford Junction. And Amtrak, Amtrak in the, in the modern time, I mean, in 2022 is, is a topical subject, but Amtrak has been on the cutoff before, and this is uh, 1979. And we'll talk about this as well, because the tracks at some point come up, they come up during the summer of 1984. So it's not all a happy story. In fact, uh, this is, uh, in a sense, gives the, uh, the, the, the cutoff, the, uh, the, gives us the sense of the, the tragedy of the cutoff. And the, one would think of the, if it were to be reborn, certainly and reborn totally would be the goal, but at least in terms of Andover, uh, would be quite a remarkable feat because uh, rarely do train, uh, do railroads um, make that transition from active railroad to abandoned railroad to active railroad again. Let me see what it looked like in 1985. This is uh, just west of uh, County Road 602, and this would be like Stanhope or back on. This is um, West Port Morris, what's left of it, probably about 1989. Oops. <clears throat> um, one of the I'll say terrible things about the uh, abandonment of the line was that it allowed the, the counties to come in and to basically do things like this. This is where the County Road 602 underpass, which is on the left, will be replaced with a, a grade crossing. And then in Pennsylvania, PennDOT decided, this is about 1990, I guess it was, uh, they decided to take down the slate for road bridge and fill it in with this. They didn't even bother to take the, the tracks away. And then um, Greendale, which we'll talk a little bit about, and but the, the reason why this is here because this bridge uh, will come down as well, and this would create a have created a great crossing, um, literally right next to the station. And while this is not Jerry Turco, it looks very, very, very much like him. I cannot find a picture of Jerry Turco. I guess nobody on Facebook liked Uncle Jerry to put a photo there, but this guy looks very, very. I found this and he looks very much as I remember him because I met him several times. And uh, we'll, we'll talk more about him. And important to know that the, one of the, the main reasons we're even talking about the possibility of restoration rail service is that in 1989, the voters in New Jersey overwhelmingly approved a bond issue for $25 million that was used to acquire the cutoff by eminent domain, by, by condemnation. So when we get to 2011, um, New Jersey Transit starts up construction, first of all, clearing the right of way, putting track down. Uh, I always joke that the, the presence of a portage on is always a sign that work is getting done. So I'm, uh, dropping the rail here. The rail train has come in. This is December of 2011. New Jersey Transit's first ride on the cutoff, short one, but it's, it still counts. And uh, all the rail they dropped, uh, about almost four miles of this has been moved elsewhere, but, well, maybe three miles, because uh, there's about a mile here that's already down, but um, still quite a bit of this is, um, that remains at Port Morris waiting to be 
pulled out west to be uh, laid down on the track on the track bed. And speaking of the track bed, it's um, right now there's a three different three disconnected sections, and this is the last one. This is near Lake Lackawanna, about mile post fifty, and this is where the track ends temporarily. And the uh, the infamous Alp Forty Four is what you're uh, lay laying derelict on the the cutoff, waiting for the scrapper to uh, put them out of their misery. I'm going to talk a little bit about Hudson Farm, which uh, caused, if in aggregate, maybe seven or eight years of uh, delay over that pipe, which you see in the middle of the, the photograph. And as uh, recently as just uh, earlier this month, uh, there was a press conference urging the New Jersey Transit Board of Directors to approve the Roseville Tunnel project, $32.5 million for the project. And uh, that this seems to have worked. They, uh, they, on April 13th, they, the board approved the, the project and gave the, the go ahead. Uh, there's one detail that needs to be worked out with uh, Andover Township, but uh, assuming that everything goes according to Hoyle, we should see activity out here in the not too distant future. Finally, 10 years, finally, after the last bit of activity on the cutoff, construction activity. I don't know if we'll ever see New Jersey Transit on the uh, Delaware River Viaduct. That's a bit of a fantasy, but you never know. Uh, certainly, maybe you can see Mantrack going down the Morristown line and uh, heading to Scranton. We'll see. Time will tell. So, okay, so that's, um, that's the sort of the, the broad, broad overview. Um, I do wanna thank certainly the, uh, the Erie Lackawanna Railroad Historical Society for inviting me. Um, a couple other thanks to go out, Pat McKnight from Steamtown. A lot of the photographs I use are from the Steamtown collection and he was kind enough to, uh, uh, to forward those on to me. Uh, certainly the photographers whose work I've borrowed and uh, all the folks who've supported the cutoff effort throughout the years. And, and then my, my wife, Kathy, my daughter, Larissa, as well, um, for their support. So uh, I never assume that when I give a presentation and I've given so many, I, it's kind of countless over the years, but um, that everyone or everyone knows what the cutoff is or that they should know what it is. Uh, this is Hoboken Festival back in, I'm um, saying like 87 or so. Uh, that's Don Barnacle in the, uh, the foreground and myself in the background. <clears throat> About midway through the presentation, or I shouldn't say the presentation, but just we had a table here and um, we were collecting petitions and such, but people come up and ask questions. About midway through, uh, a, a a young guy, I mean, it was younger than me at the time. I was maybe about 30 at the time. Um, so he's younger than me. He walks up and he says, um, he asked the question, he says, what's a cutoff? And that's kind of the type of question that you don't necessarily expect to get if you think that everybody knows what the Lackawanna cutoff is, or at least one people are going to show up at the Hoboken Festival. So it's quite clear that, I mean, I was kind of naive when I started in, in this whole effort. And over time, I learned that there, there are different levels of understanding and that not everybody understands railroading for, you know, in general, or, you know, for example, what the cutoff is in particular. So it's, it's an ongoing effort. It's an ongoing effort with the public, with the public officials and the press. So um, I hope you like maps because I'm going to show you a couple here uh, which show different things. Just if there's anyone who has any doubt where the cutoff is, it's right in here between these two spots, Port Morris Junction and Slaford Junction. This is the connection into New York, which is in Hoboken down here. Uh, if we follow a theoretical route going up the Morristown line and over the cutoff, we'd end up in Pennsylvania right here. And I'll show another map, which will actually show Scranton, which is off the map here, but these are the Poconos. Uh, there are tracks over here and there are tracks over here. 
uh, then there are some tracks here and there are no tracks here. We've seen this already. There are a number of things I'll point out in addition to Roseville Tunnel, Lake Lackawanna, Peak Westville, we've already talked about the three stations, the original stations on the cutoff. Here's the Paulinsco Viaduct, the Delaware River Viaduct. Once again, they're close together, Slateford Junction, and then the, the Delaware Water Gap. So here's a, I'll call it the ownership map because it's important oh, to realize, it's important to realize that the the entire line, not just the cutoff or the, even the line in Pennsylvania, the entire line between New York City and Scranton uh, is publicly owned. So while the New Jersey transit section, I'll call it the Andover uh, Port Morris section, which is 7.3 miles, uh, is going to be run by New Jersey Transit. It's uh, the actual right of way is owned by DOT. Uh, that's through the 1989 Bond Act. As is the so-called missing 21 miles, which is a key part because that needs to be put back as well if I'm gonna talk about service out to here. Uh, the Pennsylvania Northeast Regional Railroad Authority owns the 60 miles of railroad from Slateford Junction to Scranton and uh, well, New Jersey Transit owns everything except for the short stretch that's Amtrak owned on the Northeast Corridor east of, of Port Morris. So what's in a name? Why, why it was get it, has it been called the Lackawanna Cutoff? I've gotten questions, well, why don't you call the New Jersey Cutoff? Or, and you see the list of, and there are other names, which you, you can see if you look through historical documents where it's, um, it's been named Delaware, uh, cut off and uh, well anyway it doesn't matter there's so many different names that was part of the problem um i remember going to a transaction meeting in atlantic city and frank riley with his um his, his train uh you know pipe that he would blow and uh people would laugh saying oh there's frank talking about the lack one to cut off but the thing is people knew what the lack one to cut off and that We've tried to adopt a consistent nomenclature. Maybe it doesn't make sense for people outside of New Jersey, but within New Jersey, it wouldn't have made sense to call it the New Jersey cutoff. I say, what, what does that mean? So that, that's why we, and we've, we've stuck with that. The, the railroad called it the Lackawanna cutoff, by the way, but, it, it, they, um, but over, the, over time, the, the, the press would call it the high line and it starts to get confusing. So we adopted the one name and we've tried to stick with that. So a little bit about me because, you know, you might wonder who is this guy that's up here. Um, I grew up right next to the Morristown line in South Orange. You can see this is looking out the porch with my dog, Shannon, back in the day. Um, maybe or maybe I, I think my room was maybe 30 some odd feet from track two. The house, there's a, a legend that goes to the house. The, the house that was supposedly built in 1848 but there is a, a legend that goes that it was actually moved for the railroad coming through, but the railroad came through in 1837. So I don't know how that could have worked, but unless the records are, are faulty. But interesting, this would have been an interesting place to have been in 1888 and during the blizzard of 1888, because there were a dozen trains that were stranded in the snow banks um, along the, the, the railroad behind the house. And I wonder how many people showed up in the middle of the night or during the storm to, for shelter or, uh, or did they stay in trains? I, I don't know. This is, you know, we're talking many, 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 many years ago. So how do I get, how do I get involved in all this? Well, my next door neighbor, Martin Breitzbecker was a retired conductor in the Lackawanna. He was so uh, the suburban lines. He also, he must've been a brakeman. He was, had several fingers or parts of fingers missing. Uh, <laughs> Carrie, uh, his wife, the two of them took me on the Phoebe Snow. We went, well, actually we had to go east to go west. We went uh, from Mountain Station to Brick Church and then headed out and went over the cutoff and we ended up in East Stroudsburg and then came back. I was three and a half at the time. So this is 1960. I, I have vague remembrances of it. I, was, I remember sitting in the Tavern Lounge um, having a uh, Shirley Temple. And there was uh, one of the things that struck me 
Well, one of the things that struck me about being the Phoebe Snow that uh, unlike being in the uh, the MUs that my mother used to take me on, uh, there were actually was carpeting uh, in the cars. Uh, and the, when you went between cars while the train was moving, they, the, the vestibules were closed instead of the scary ones with the, the, the MUs, which were open. Uh, but above and beyond that, I remember the sensation of being, uh, I'm going to say I'd never been a plane up until that time, but the sensation that you were in a low flying plane as best as I can describe it because of these, these tall fills that you that is on the cutoff. East Strasburg, where we turned around, got another train back. Uh, I remember Roseville Tunnel on the way back. I don't remember it on the westbound trip, but I do remember it on the eastbound trip. And then I'm, I take a long sabbatical. I got a bunch of other things like to basically graduate high school, college. I worked for the pharmaceutical industry for the better part of 40 years. Um, I joined the Tri-State Group in 84. That's the same year that the cutoff was torn up. Um, joined North Jersey Rail Commuter Association, 86. Uh, that's, I jumped right in meeting with, uh, with Jerry Turco, with uh, Fred Wirtz, who was the head of the group at that time. Did a number of presentations um, back in 88, 89. Um, and uh, actually, I was actually, um, I was asked to do the original um, draft of the bridge bond bill. It was very, I'll say very, general in terms of the what was asked of me but uh, I, I submitted and that started it um i was part of uh, the beginning of the uh, charter member of penn jersey um i got married in 92 i have two kids two, two great kids logan 80 who's 28 and the rest was 24 um i was a member of the rail museum commission in the late 90s i've done uh, some author work with wikipedia the black one cut off historical committee and then the uh, Lackawanna Cutoff channel on YouTube with Larissa, my daughter, is my videographer. We've done over 50 videos. So, yes, uh, encourage you to take a look there. Uh, a lot of stuff on the cutoff. And there's still more to come. Chuck, I have a quick question for you. I'm yes. not sure if you're going to cover this. That's the reason I'm asking. You mentioned Jerry Turco in the slide. Uh, there may be people out there who don't understand who Turco yeah, is. I, I will explain who Turco is. I will explain okay. who Jerry Turco is. I want to make yes. sure you're going to cover that. Yeah. Right. Yes. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Um, the gentleman in the, middle, in the middle here is Tom Gagliano. He'll eventually become the executive director of New Jersey Transit. But I'm a little bit more interested in the man on his left, our left, and that's uh, Mayor um, Charlie Rydell of, of Freeling Eisen Township, who was the longest serving mayor and uh, New Jersey history at that point. We're going to talk a lot more about him in a little bit. Uh, WFMZ, we did a, a, a spot there, literally within the, this is in the Blairstown train station. Uh, Larry Wills on the far left, he's the, at that time, the chairman of the Monroe County. I got to get it. Party. Give me a second. Larry Wills is the uh, right. chairman of the Monroe County Railroad Authority. Maurice uh, Lewis, Fred Wirtz, who I previously mentioned, and then myself on the far right. And we'll talk it's a little bit about the videos. This is the first one I did back in uh, 2016. If you're going to really want to know some of the background, the important background on why it's so difficult to reactivate an abandoned rail line, watch Port 18. This is Larry Malski. Um, he will... You know, it's, it, there's a lot of information on, on, on why it, it takes so long. And so the stuff we did was kind of neat. We, we flew over the cutoff. Um, this is uh, Josh Weinstein with my daughter in the, in the back there. Uh, this one wasn't so much fun. Uh, this is 21, uh, part 21 I did in six parts. This is the missing 21 miles. I did all of that. Uh, not so easy on a bike and... Uh, with a GoPro, but I made it somehow. Six, six uh, separate segments to do it. And then the most recent one is the update. And the parts are more historical. And as Paul mentioned, in some cases long, not maybe hopefully not too long, but, uh, but the updates are more like breaking news and are, are, are much shorter uh, in length. And uh, one of the upcoming videos will be paranormal activity on the cutoff. 
So uh, why was the cutoff built? I mean, if you want to understand the cutoff, well, why does it exist at all? You actually have to go back quite a ways to yeah, basically the beginning of the Lackawanna. When the Lackawanna was building back in the 1850s and coming east through the Poconos and through the, the water gap, their intent was to connect to the central railroad of New Jersey, the CNJ, way actually literally off the map here where Washington is, but actually at Hampton, which is five miles east of there. Um, because that they were, the Lackawanna was going to use the CNJ as its eastern connection. Um, that doesn't go well. And that merger lasts all of about a year. And uh, the, the old road, as it will become, um, becomes a circuitous route that is going to, in a sense, plague the, the Lackawanna for half a century. But mm -hmm. at the very beginning, the plan at the very beginning, the plan was to run basically trains back and forth uh, to, I guess it would have been Elizabethport via the uh, CNJ. Uh, the Lackawanna didn't like this for the, one reason was that they, they didn't control the eastern 50 miles of their railroad. So they end up leasing the Morris and Essex, which creates the what will eventually become known as the old road. It's not the old road until the new road is built, but um, it's 11 miles longer than the route that would replace it. So in a sense, that's one reason or one rationale for, for building the cutoff years later uh, there are other reasons that not only is the route circuitous, it's slow, you have two tunnels, one in particular is a big problem, we'll talk about that momentarily, but um, it's, uh, it, it was basically, it, it wasn't working for the Lackawanna, but it will take them over half a century to correct the problem. And the person who's going to be the one who's going to push to correct the problem is going to be the man on the left, and that's William Truesdale, the president of the the Lackawanna, who um, he was president for um, a quarter century. And here's the big bottleneck. You have a 400 mile main line double track and you have this single, basically single track railroad uh, through this tunnel, which would cause um, significant, it could, could cause significant backups. Um, Originally, it's amazing to think that they actually were able at some point to get double track through here. Uh, originally, it was built for six foot gauge, so there's only one track originally. But, um, but when uh, Truesdale comes in, they actually put in gauntlet track, which is essentially a single overlapping track through the, the tunnel, which was, and here you see it uh, just a few years ago, 10 years ago. And um, uh, it's just amazing to think that could have. Uh, <laughs> But this, this was a problem. This was definitely a problem. One of the reasons, if there was a major problem and the reason for the cutoff being built, it probably was Oxford Tunnel. So even though they start talking about it as early as 1901 about replacing the, what would become known as the old road, it takes them a number of years. Uh, 1905, 1906, they're really in high gear. They're surveying different routes. Some of them had amazingly long amounts of tunneling to be done. This one here, line uh, D, I believe it is, or G rather, uh, had three, three tunnels and then it didn't eliminate this particular grade out of Netcom. So they started looking at going uh, in this trajectory. The problem was up here. They, until they envisioned the Pequest fill, they were thinking about, well, we have to go down here to get around that. And then we have to go around what we, where Roseville Tunnel would end up, although they didn't think that there would be a tunnel. But essentially this, this is the, the route that was built, but they looked at a number of different routes. In fact, into the 1950s, I remember did a, a presentation in Hope. They told me that there were actually were easements in Hope for the line that probably, I'm assuming this line uh, into the 1950s. So there's actually a press run that's run on the, on the cutoff, December 15th, 1911. Um, Truesdale told his people to put it together. He didn't want any part of it. Uh, he was not known to be, um, he was camera shy. And unfortunately, there's no photographs. You would hope they would have put Mr. Bunnell in there, but uh, it didn't happen. Um, 
Probably many of you have seen this comparison. I'll just point out the highlights. I mean, there, there are significant improvements that the cutoff uh, creates. Of course, the 11 miles is uh, shorter is certainly one of them. Um, the number of curves is dramatically uh, fewer on the cutoff. And the, the gradient or the uh, curvature rather, well, the gradient too, but the curvier, curvature is uh, greatly improved. Um, the length of uh, curved uh, track and rise and fall, there actually is a little bit of rise on the cutoff, not very much near Johnsonburg. It's basically all downhill, as it turns out. Um, and then the tunnels, well, there is that one tunnel, which they didn't want, but it, it turned out that's, well, they got a tunnel anyway. And then uh, we talk about the Pequest fill, about basically half of the entire fill on the entire cutoff. Well, when we talk about Mr. Turco, that becomes a big um, to-do. The, uh, the Pequest fill was actually at least touted, whether it was or not, was touted as being the largest railroad fill in the world when it was built. Did a nice brochure uh, for the, it was actually not a brochure, it was a timetable, but a, a brochure in the timetable about the cutoff. And a plug for my, I actually did a, a, um, a uh, an episode, part six, on why the cutoff was built. And we visit all the, the different uh, towns on the uh, the old road, um, including those on the Warren Railroad. And we, I, I, I won't go into the difference, but there is a slight difference between what is the old road and actually what was the Warren Railroad that uh, Mr. Mr. Blair built. Now, many people, uh, you, you think of the cutoff as being straight and being flat. Well, it's, it's not straight, although they're, you know, the, the curvature is pretty good, but it's not certainly not flat. Uh, if you look at the, this, um, uh, this map here, it, it shows you that the, uh, well, you have to figure that if you start up here at Port Morris, you're at about 900 feet above sea level and you end up about 300 feet above sea level at the Delaware Water Gap. That's 600 feet. Divide that by roughly 30 miles, that's roughly 20 uh, feet per mile. And uh, actually the ruling grade is 29 feet per mile, which is 0.55%. Now what, what's significant about that? That's exactly one quarter of the maximum, I'll say the, um, the agreed upon grade that you would ever have on a main line in the US, which is 2.2% whole bunch of sidings on the cutoff, which you can see here. Um, you have Port Morris siding, Roseville siding, as it was called, although it wasn't right at the tunnel, uh, Greendale siding, Johnsonburg siding, Blairstown siding, Haynesburg siding, and then Slateford siding. All these sidings, you wonder, why, couldn't they have built this one, the third track instead of all these different sidings? Well, they, when they build the Pennsylvania cutoff, they, I think they, they learned that lesson, perhaps. I don't know, or maybe it was just the way the the the, uh, the railroad was set up that 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 made more sense in Pennsylvania than it did in New Jersey. Okay, so now we're going to look at the construction. I'm not going to do too much construction, but a little bit, and do a tour, a, a geographical tour of the line from the east side to the west side. So basically, from Port Morris to uh, the Delaware Water Gap. Okay. Um, the, the construction ran from August 1st of 08 to December 23rd of 11. I don't know that they were actually doing construction on the 23rd, but that's theoretically that's because the 24th is when the actual uh, railroad opened. Seven different sections and contractors, the length of the sections and the amount of work that was involved in each section varied, it actually varied greatly as it turned out. It was originally projected that it would take 36 months and that it would have been completed at the end of July of 1911, but it took another five months because of delays at Roseville Tunnel and uh, the Pequest Fill. And uh, President Truesdale must have assumed that he didn't you know, have to worry about any of this, so he took a long vacation and he, he's away for the better part of two months. Um, you look at his correspondence and the, the, his secretary has to keep on telling people, oh, he'll be back any day now. And uh, he's, he's still over in Europe, as it turns out. He, he didn't want to come back, or so it seems. Um, inspection team, uh, training that he, um, um, they, 
they went to, I guess, cajole the folks that uh, who were handling the Flickweir people, um, who became Flickweir and Bush, uh, Section 3, because they, they, they were lagging behind. And uh, so they're going to Truesdale second from the, the right here, and his team are going over to probably twist the arms. There you see a den now of uh, the, what is now the Sussex, Sussex Branch Trail. This was the Sussex Branch you see above, south of the cutoff. So uh, a little background on the construction, 28.45 miles of new right-of-way, roughly 66 miles of track that includes sidings, seven sets of east and westbound sidings, um, two viaducts, three stations, technically four, because I count Lake Apacon, because all that Lake Apacon station was rebuilt in anticipation of the, the cutoff, uh, three towers, Port Morris, Greendale, and Slateford. And uh, the old world, actually, even after the cutoff opens, will in effect be add extra capacity for the cutoff. And that will have tragic results, um, which I'll point out in a little bit. 12 overhead bridges, 19 underpasses, four separate rail underpasses, six rail rights of way, uh, and um, one trolley line, which actually passed over the, the cutoff two canal undercrossings uh, for the Y and the main line at Port Morris, and then 73 concrete structures in total with one that was not a concrete structure, which we'll talk about. And there you see the cutoff. So we're gonna go east to west, starting at Lake Apacon. Um, Tabor in his book calls this one of the most interesting stations on the, the Lackawanna Railroad and um, Sure, why not? Uh, intermo intermodal, multimodal. You have the canal, you have the railroad, you have a trolley line, you have, uh, of course, roadway. Um, you have this very nice station, the overhead uh, walkway. Uh, this was a, a, a big deal place back in the day, probably until about the Depression. But uh, during the, the summer months, uh, people coming up here to Bert Bertrand Island for the day, it was, you know, this was a big deal. The problem for the Lackawanna was that it was only busy for, you know, the summer months, June, July, and August, mostly, I guess. Um, so, but um, this, is, uh, this is what it looked like back when it, just after it opened. But it was open because they had to expand the four tracks, so it's really um, attributable to the cutoff directly, even though the cutoff is, well, the cutoff is about a quarter mile west of here where it starts. Port Morris Yard, just west of there. And there you see the like one limited passing UN tower coming onto the cutoff. Reverse view um, looking uh, where the, the cutoff will be rebuilt. Um, the, I'd say the switch I'm guessing will be somewhere in this neighborhood. I don't know exactly where, but they, um, a prefab switches off in the weeds right next to it. So I'm, it's, I'm guessing it's gonna be somewhere in heat. <clears throat> um, but that's 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 going to coming along. It'll be a few years yet. So, looking at Port Morris area, we'll go I guess clockwise, uh, like a Pat Kong, uh, Port Morris to town and the yard, Montclair Booten line to Nat Kong, and then Hackettstown will be down here, like a Mesca Nat Kong. Here's the Port Morris Y. Of course, the cutoff through here, the Morris Canal through here, um, Morris, uh, Mar uh, the Canal Street as uh, for the canal where it ran, Center Street, which we'll see a photo from there. Lake Apaco is literally right off the photo here, so it's right nearby. Okay, the canal with the cutoff being built. When you see those two arrows, those two. Those two spots, those, uh, those abutments are still there, buried as they would have been in 1924. Um, we'll show a photo of the actual bridge, which here it is. Wasn't there very long. It was there probably 13 years and then taken out. Um, the, um, when the, the, the basically, there, I've never seen a photo of the, uh, companion bridge, shall we say, that the, the, the Y track must have had because it would have to have been something similar to this, although no, maybe not as big, obviously, but it would have to provide the same amount of clearance. 
but um, this is uh, this was you know, a unique thing for the cutoff because it was the only thing that on the cutoff that was not made of reinforced concrete. Okay, here's Center Street, the cutoff, the bridge um, in the foreground, and the single track Y track, the west uh, leg of the Y for Portmore Shard in the, uh, the background. Okay, I think we've seen this photo already, but here to give you the rest of the story, after they finished building the, the grade crossing, this is what it looks like, sort of like now. Um, it's not the best, this, this will have, uh, this will be a quiet zone, they'll have quad gates, and, but, but still it's, uh, it's a grade crossing on a, a rail line that when it was built didn't have any grade crossing. So it's a shame that, that we have to, you know, in a sense, have this. It's obviously um, undesirable to say the least, but it is what it is. Okay, moving on. Another bridge, um, well, there are a couple bridges on the cutoff that have been replaced or in this case added. Um, you see the original County Road 605, uh, Sparta Stanhope Road bridge in the, the background here. Uh, this bridge was added in, uh, well, opened in 2008 and straightened out the road and eliminated the uh, necessity for the, the 1911 bridge, which is now basically used for a trail. Lake Lackawanna from the, the cutoff. Wharton Phil looking from on top of what will eventually be Roseville Tunnel. When this photo was taken, the plan was still for it to be an open cut. Um, Lake Lackawanna would be up here. This stuff, uh, this stuff, this, this area will fill in with water. You can see here is right pond. I'm not sure if this is called Roseville Pond. Um, uh, Wolf Lake here and then, oops, back here. Um, and back up here, there's um, where Lake Lackawanna is. So there's a series of ponds that are dammed. And they, they create um, basically um, a series of, of bodies of water that interlock. By the way, I'm going to go just go back to this from here. Th this, this body of water, which really technically doesn't exist anymore, was called Pumpkin Run. And Lubber's Run was what created uh, Lake Lackawanna, by the way. So these, these runs. Here's, um, uh, this is basically from the same time as the other photo from on top of the tunnel. Um, they're not doing a tunnel yet. It's still, they won't make, the decision, the official decision to do the tunnel won't be made until December of 1909. Uh, President Truesdale mulls it over for a couple of months. He can't bring himself to do it, but he eventually is forced to. Uh, there was in, because of unstable anticline rock, and um, as a result, it was deemed that it was necessary to do a, a, a tunnel rather than a, a, an open fill where you could daylight it. You can't daylight the tunnel. I know that be, there, there have been questions. You, oh, can't you daylight it? No, the, um, the State Historic Preservation Office, uh, SHPO, uh, determined that you can't. So therefore, that's the reason why Roseville Tunnel will remain a, a tunnel. And so it's, you can't daylight it. Mm -hmm. So here's Roseville Tunnel. I think sometime in the 1920s, there were some outbuildings here at, uh, associated with the tunnel. There you see uh, what it looks like. Uh, well, this is back in the late 80s. You can see the top of the tunnel has been blasted away. Um, to access this, uh, you, you go to C.O. Johnson Park in, in Byram, which is over in here. And there's a um, well, it's a little tough getting over here, but once you get over here, there's uh, the what you saw in the previous photo where the, the tracks go off. There's a narrow gauge right of way which comes and circles around and brings you right down to the, the tunnel here. So it's kind of neat. You see the, uh, I think this is the lack one, a limited you know, when they're doing the transition into dieselization and uh, modernizing the uh, passenger equipment. Uh, west of uh, the tunnel is Colby Cut, and uh, this side of the, the, the north side of the right-of-way had a rockfall mitigation. Well, it actually had a rockfall detector system, which would set the 
signals to red if there was a major rock fall that occurred here. Um, it's planned for the New Jersey Transit Project. This would be like a uh, receive some kind of netting type of thing, which you sometimes see in, in different places um, where they you know, prevent rock fall that way. Um, but, uh, and then there's drainage issues as well. we'll, we'll we can talk about Russell Tunnel, that project uh, in greater depth later on. And one more shot at uh, Roseville. Okay, now we move to Andover. Um, this is what would be the Andover station stop. Um, this this um, culvert here will be replaced as part of the Roseville Tunnel project, but also this stream here is the um, been the thing that has tied the, the cutoff project in knots uh, over wetlands first and then 500 feet upstream, the Hudson Farm issue, which I showed you the, uh, that pipe. Um, this is, uh, ten, well, basically 10 years worth of delays um, because of a, was what is technically a trout stream. You can see it's, if, if, you, if, it, if it's much more than the trickle, it means you must be having a rainstorm, but it's, it's basically, a, well, anyway, don't get me started on this, but it's, it's um, it is what it is, but um, milepost fifty three. Uh, but this this is the Phoebe snow coming through, and this is uh, where New Jersey Transit would be stopping. Now we talk about the Pequest Fill. Um, this is the Sussex branch where it goes under the Pequest Fill. Well, it doesn't. You know, Pequest Fill is this huge uh, fill. Why is it not the, the why does the cutoff not look like it's on a big fill? Well, it's because the Sussex branch is on a big fill at this location, so the cutoff went over it. Um, on a very small fill, but only at this one location. And this is just beyond the 206 uh, tunnel, which is going to be undergoing uh, rehabilitation and closure for about a year coming up in the not too distant future. Center point, roughly speaking, of the Pequest fill is where the Lee Hunt and Hudson River Railway uh, went underneath. It'll be somewhere over in here someplace, I'm guessing. See the Pequest fill. Uh, when they doctor that picture for the uh, uh, Phoebe Snow, they, they somehow had to take out this one, the, uh, the siding track, by the way. <laughs> Pequest fill, the, the west end. Uh, they actually had to keep track of all the tracks for the, uh, the construction um, trains or the, you know, they devised this, it looks like, I don't know, the buckets or something that hung on this semaphore thing. And they, uh, somehow this D uh, indicates that which tracks would, were occupied so they could keep track of, so they didn't send a, uh, an, an engine up into an occupied track, I guess. I mean, presumably that's the reason why it was, uh, you know, done that way. Now we're going to do a little bit of spying on a, a, a uh, a few folks that are sitting in the vestibule of the back of this uh, this train, July 11th, 1914. Uh, looks like mom and dad are hot or, or mom is exhausted and uh, looks like the son is with an au pair or a, um, you know, a nanny um, on the back of the train. Um, when I saw the date, I don't know why this, but, but I, I just happened to be searching. And on this date, there's just so happens probably almost literally at the time that this, this train is going through Greendale. This is uh, just east of Greendale. This was going on. This, this guy, Babe Ruth, is making his major league debut pitching for the Boston Red Sox, um, who beat the Cleveland Naps 4-3 to three on that day. The, the Naps will become the Indians, who will become the Guardians. Speaking of Greendale, here we are. When this photograph was taken, it was not Greendale yet. It was Greensville. It would be for another three, four years. Um, there must have been something that they felt would be confusing or maybe there was some other reason. Who, kn who knows, but <clears throat> whatever the case, uh, Green Greensville became Greendale. The station and the, uh, the tower, both which exist to this day. And um, 
uh, we're trying to uh, make into a museum, by the way. Speaking of which, and I promised uh, Steve Kelmer I would uh, talk about this. We're looking for water at Greendale. We, we know that there had to have been a well. We can't locate it. You can see above here a map with the um, ice house and creamery. <clears throat> there was a boiler room. We think it would have been here, but uh, we don't know for sure. I'll show you that location in just a second here. There's Greendale. Uh, Steve does a lot of our landscaping and does a wonderful job here. It's quite an improvement over what we took over a, you know, a number of years ago. All right, you see the, uh, the creamery or the remains of the creamery back here, and then a cold storage, I don't know, okay, a building, but it's very small shed. I don't know what you call it, but, uh, but this is where we think the well could be, but uh, we're looking for any information. So uh, either contact me or Steve Kelmer. Um, it's, um, we'll see, you know, we hope to get, uh, it would be, it would be easier for us, let's so put it that way, that if we can actually have a, a working well already, then have to drill one. And here's Greendale. Back in uh, 79 from uh, when the Amtrak special is coming through. <coughs> and this is the uh, artist rendering. We, we, we hope it will someday look like, or something like this. Johnson Burke, the next station. And uh, here's Armstrong Cut. We'll be talking about that. And here's this, what this was, was some kind of shed, but it plays out in our, uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, Johnson Burke or Greendale are, I think virtually identical in construction. Um, Johnsonburg, though, its fate has not been as uh, as good as let's put it that way for as Greendale, because this is basically what's left of it, just the floor. It was torn down. There's a different versions of the story, but it was torn down and um, it's gone, unfortunately. So. Speaking of stories, I have three stories to tell. I call them Johnsonburg because in, in some shape or form, they all involve Johnsonburg or Freeling Heisen Township in some shape or form. From 1941, 1958, and 1924. The 41 version is uh, this, so Armstrong Cut Collapses. The story behind this is that this happens in the middle of the night. And there was somebody that they, the station, the passenger station was closed at that point. But there's somebody, there's either night watchman or somebody that's there um, on the premises. And he hears this enormous crash. And he goes out, I guess, with a lantern or flashlight, whatever. And he sees what's happened here. He has no way to contact the... Um, dispatcher so he 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 i guess in a frantic manner calls the only i think the only place he could put a call to was in the outside world was to end over junction on the sussex branch and he calls him and says you got to stop all the trains on the cutoff we you know have a massive lot landslide you know blah 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 whatever and that's basically the the agent at uh, andover junction takes it from there and they they stop the the trains from coming forth. Um, very lucky. I mean, you can't imagine what would have happened for you know a train going 70 or 80 miles an hour hitting this. It would have been a catastrophe. So very fortunately, but they this closed the cutoff for about a month and all the trains had to be rerouted via the old road. So good thing there that the old road was still there, I guess you could say. And uh, <coughs> I, I Stop by here about 1990, and this is where they, uh, you can see in the, this area where they, uh, they cut back, where they uh, shaved it back to try to prevent any future landslides. Okay, story number two actually doesn't start at Johnsonburg, but it starts at Port Morris. It's the runaway of the cement cars and the caboose. 
the caboose is on the west end. Um, somehow this string gets moving westbound. Uh, there are different versions of the story, it, but it's, it's sitting on the so-called pinnacle. That's what Bob Barr has referred to it as the flat spot at the very um, top of the grade. Somehow there, there are multiple tries to try to couple onto the string to, um, to basically you know, move it out of here. Um, and what happens is they get pushed and they start to drift west and they start picking up speed and more and more speed. Um, by 6.30, so it's obviously this is quite early uh, in the morning uh, that this has occurred. There's a near collision which takes place here. And you can see that um, train NE4, which is a hot shot for, the, um, for New England, is coming up uh, what would be, I guess that would be track two. The cars are coming westbound on track two. And either by some sort of signal indication, or you can see up here, there's a uh, the, uh, rather unique uh, order board, train order board signal that um, indicated to the, the train crew they, that they have to dive off. Maybe even saw the string coming out of whatever the case is, they get off just in the nick of time onto this siding here at, um, at Greendale. Legend has it that the markers of the two cabooses hit. In other words, the, the marker on the, the runaway and the marker on the train diving into the, um, the siding hit. Whether that's true or not, but it's, it's been out there for as long as this uh, particular story has been out there. And uh, this is Bob Bart telling the story with John Sabatka. Uh, which you can hear in you know, greater detail in part 23 of my uh, uh, cutoff series on video. But the reason why the, the Johnsonburg connection is this is this man, Jerry Cruz, I've also interviewed. He was at Johnsonburg when the, the runaway came past, chased by what he said was an RS3 trying to catch it. He obviously did not catch it, but um, as far as we know, Jerry is the only living person who witnessed uh, that runaway. And uh, this is where they ended up in the, uh, in the drink, as uh, Jerry put it, in, in the Delaware, near Point of Gap. The final story has a sort of poignant, uh, poignancy to it. Um, uh, Mayor Charlie Rud Rydell of Freeling Highs, and he was at this point, this is the late eighties um, when I first met him, um, was had been mayor for 40 years, which at that point was the longest serving mayor. I don't know if anyone has eclipsed that in the meantime, but he went on to serve for at least a few years longer. But he was a huge supporter of the cutoff and in ways that were rather surprising. I won't go into any of those, but take my word for it. He was a huge supporter, but it never really made that like, you know, what was, what was with this? You know, why was he such a big supporter? Well, his, his farm was by bisected by the, the cutoff. He, he had a farm in uh, Freeling Eisen Township here. Um, this is a, a shot I took from the right of way. Um, and uh, one day he called me up and anyway, he took me for a tour and he, he brought me over here. And he started explaining that they used to be able to let him ride on the, the this is where uh, the sidings were. This is actually four tracks at one point, uh, the main line in the middle, and then the sidings uh, for, um, for uh, the uh, Johnsonburg sidings on each, both east and west. And I think, like, oh, okay, that, that might, might be it. And no, that wasn't the reason. Um, then he told the story of what happened one night in 1924. Um, it was the same year his mother had died. So it was a, a terrible year. And uh, in November, it was uh, in the middle of the night and an outbuilding next to the farmhouse caught fire. A westbound freight train saw the fire and stopped at this stop here, this location, this grade crossing, if you will. The fireman and the engineer abandoned their train one goes in and, and tries to 
start putting out the fire. The other one wakes the family. The family's asleep. They have no clue what's going on. They may end up saving the outbuilding or you know, barn or whatever it was. There were some animals in it too. They saved the animals. They saved the house. They, they may even have saved the family for all we know. And that, that when he told the story, and then I realized this is why Charlie Rydell was a, such a big supporter of the cutoff. He felt like in the sense he was paying back for what the railroad had done for him and his family. Blairstown. One of the, uh, it became the major stop on the cutoff over time. Um, Phoebe Snow, this is the only place that the, uh, the name trains would stop. Um, any train actually for that matter would stop on the cutoff in, in later years. Blair Academy students waiting. Um, talking about Jerry Cruz again, he said that um, there was a six o'clock train, which I guess would have been the twilight. I'm not sure, but he said it was uh, it was not unusual for 30 or 40 people back in the 1960s to get off that train. So it was um, well patronized in, in spite of the fact there weren't that many trains running at the time. And this is Jerry meeting Art Erdman for the first time. The two of them worked as towermen simultaneously, but they never met until uh, I got them together. Um, it would have been last October they got together. That's, so that's part 31. You can hear all the stories that they were able to tell. But one of the stories that <coughs> Art told, Artie told, was that of the lost train on the cutoff. It was coming east. And uh, he ended up having to call the DJ here at uh, the station, which is at this point in the, in the 70s, this would have been the EL days, um, would have been a radio station by that time. It was uh, no longer obviously a passenger station. There was a bit of a quirk uh, on the model board at uh, the UN Tower at Port Morris, which controlled the cutoff or most of the cutoff. And that was that when a train was between East Slateford and West Greendale, uh, there was a, an indicator light, but you didn't know that the train could be here, it could be there, or it could be anywhere in between. Well, as it so happens, when Artie called the DJ, the train was just coming up the hill and it was you know, within sight of the station. So we, that he was able to determine where the, the train was, but otherwise you would have no idea where the train was exactly. <clears throat> Okay, now talking about construction, there are two different ways that the, um, the contractors uh, who built the cutoff built fills. One was this way, the cable method or cable tower method, where the, uh, the dinky locomotives would push these, um, well, I think there were three ton each or, um, or three cubic yards each um, and would dump their loads and they would build the fill uh, bit by bit across. That was one way to do it. If you had a deep valley like here, it would work. On flat areas, it didn't work. So you know, they would build um, a scaffolding or a trestle type of thing. And they'd fill it in that way. Um, as you can see, this house is, looks like it's in the way and uh, probably is not long for this world. Uh, uh, there's also a schoolhouse in Huntsville that met the same fate in the... Uh, um, the, the Lackawanna was obliged to re replace the, the building with another schoolhouse. <coughs> that school building that replaced it still exists, by the way. Uh, Paulinska Viaduct. Um, something's happened to this building that burned down, you know, the Susquehanna building. It blown up, we don't know. Um, I heard that they, they actually sued the Lackawanna because they claim that it was due to a cinder coming off a train off the top of the viaduct, which seems highly unlikely, but uh, I don't know if that's true. That may be just a, a, a legend. Okay, Susquehanna, of later years, um, and uh, Lackawanna hot shot up on the viaduct, probably doing 60 miles an hour. Uh, we've seen this shot already uh, west of the, the viaduct. Interesting spot, um, what, on the left will be today's Route 94. On the right, the 
the Lackawanna was obliged to maintain a right-of-way open for the Lehigh New England Railway. Um, they, they ended up keeping or you know, using trackage rights over the Susquehanna uh, over here because they used the same uh, railroad uh, until Hainsburg Junction, just south of the viaduct here. But, um, but there are different spots where they, the L and NE actually did build, but they never used this, this particular right of way here. Uh, they, they abandoned the, the whole project, but um, in later years, it would become, it would finally get a use and it would be used as a connector between the two uh, parts of the, what is called the tunnel field. Um, it's soccer fields and uh, baseball fields and that kind of stuff, the basketball court, but it's used by the township of, uh, of Knowlton for their recreational purposes. Hainsburg Junction and the, uh, the distance. This is taken off of Stark Road. And this is uh, the bridge, Stark Road. We're now nearing the Delaware, Delaware River. Uh, this is where the Susquehanna again crossed under the, uh, the cutoff. It wound around through the town of Columbia and came through here. Here we look back, this is Simpson Road. McDonald's, if you're familiar with that, ex exit four is just uh, down the road a piece in, in the direction that we're looking here. This is uh, Delaware River Viaduct. You, I think many of us are familiar with this because Route 80 goes underneath it. Um, and the, uh, the MU that came through yesterday would have gone right over through here, traveling eastbound. This is westbound. See the, uh, the viaduct uh, nearing completion. And by this point, it's very close to completion in April of 11. The two viaducts were finished relatively early um, in, in relation to the rest of the project. And as I said, the uh, Roseville Tunnel was really uh, the thing in the Peak West Flow where there were things that were lagging behind. They actually worked at nights. They, were, they, they had uh, torch uh, light going to, uh, to keep going. Uh, not here, though, but at, uh, you know, on the Peak West Phil, because they, they, <laughs> they uh, try to meet a deadline. Interesting that Mr. Bunnell took a photo off of the uh, Delaware River Viaduct. Here's relatively the, the same shot, looking at the Delaware Water Gap. And that uh, arrow points to the sharp curve, which is at the uh, far end of the, the viaduct. It's really the only speed restricting curve. I mean, speed restricting if you're talking about 70 miles an hour or more or less, um, depending on the year, it was either 50 or 55 miles an hour. And Slate for Junction would be right about here. This is actually before the cutoff opened. So it's taken from Mount Mincy. Um, it's not taken from a plane, even though it looks like it's taken from a plane, but um, this is taken during the summer of 1911. So the cutoff is still under construction. When uh, the cutoff came through, they went through a cemetery and uh, they actually had to move some graves, which had to be reinterred here up in, uh, this is um, Riverview Cemetery in, in Portland. So somewhere there were folks who were originally buried uh, where the cutoff is now are now um, buried here um, in, this, uh, in this cemetery. And now Slate for Junction. See four tracks. Um, and then this track goes into a 70 foot turntable. And then two tracks on the, uh, the old road. And of course Slate for Tower. See the Delaware is frozen solid. Now a couple iterations of the trackage here in Slateford. Uh, this is, uh, at this point, the, the cutoff has been single tracked and this is actually a siding. This is the, the main line, even though it looks like it should be the op other way around. You can see we're down to one track on the old road. 759 coming through. One track. And 
And I don't even know if you'll be seeing much in the way of um, car storage here because they, at the time of this photo, they were the Delaware Lackawanna was still interchanging, I believe, at, uh, at Portland. They don't do that anymore. So um, uh, that, that was switched to Taylor outside of uh, Scranton. So uh, they may s store some cars down here from time to time, but you don't, you don't see much in the way of activity down here anymore, except for Amtrak. Amtrak was coming down today, by the way. Um, they're, uh, they're high railing the, uh, the line. Okay, now we're going to do, we, we've done the geographical, now we're going to do the chronological. And you can say, well, the, the cutoff has been owned by, has had five different owners, uh, except for the owners that, you know, before the, the cutoff was uh, built, but the individual landowners. Uh, you have the Lackawanna, you have the Erie Lackawanna, you have Conrail. Um, 1986, you have Jerry Turco and Burton Goldmeyer, who, who buy the the cutoff from Conrail. Uh, Mr. Turco, um, when I talked to him, the story he told me, the, how he ended up buying the cutoff was that he wanted to expand his nursing home operation in Andover, which was next to the Lehigh and Hudson River uh, Railway uh, right of way. And he asked Conrail if he could by about a thousand feet of that right of way. And they said, no deal, they, we won't, we're not gonna sell you an isolated piece. Um, long story short, he, they end up offering him the entire 32 miles of the Lehigh and Hudson River Railway, which he buys, plus the cutoff, another 20, well, it was 27, because it wasn't the full 28 and a half, but also the, the portion in, in Pennsylvania. So he ends up buying like 60 miles of, of railroad right of way. And, um, and he will hold on to the cutoff until it's condemned from him um, and Mr. Goldmeyer uh, officially in 2001. And that's how the DOT, the New Department of Transportation in New Jersey ended up owning the cutoff and the Pennsylvania Northeast uh, Regional Railroad Authority in Pennsylvania on that one mile section of the cutoff in, in Pennsylvania. Okay, we'll go through the decades. The line officially opens on Christmas Eve, 1911. It was a Sunday, so it was picked because it was probably the least um, uh, problematic to do it on that day. Uh, most of the trains that were previously went through the old, via the old road now go at least through trains go th will now go through the cutoff or via the cutoff. Um, at the very beginning, they didn't know what to do. They, they Greensville, Johnsonburg, and Blairstown um, get, have the same number of trains stopping. Um, they, they will slowly figure out that uh, Greendale, as it will become, and Johnsonburg are not big passenger stations. Um, they also test out some long freights, and uh, those tests turned out to be pretty much a disaster on the cutoff, uh, trying 200 car trains, and to, it just didn't work. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, 1916, Greensville becomes Greendale. Um, nationalization in, um, I want to say 1917, somewhere in there. Um, the resorts of Delaware Water Gap um, are really begin their decline. There's no official steam limit on the, on the line as of yet. Uh, they, uh, engineers are expected to use good judgment, whatever that means in terms of their speeds. Now I referenced about the, the fact that they, the old road became a, uh, say a secondary outlet for trains running over the, uh, the cutoff. Well, this is the one that has the tragic uh, results. Um, uh, that's the Rockport wreck in outside of Hackettstown. Uh, the, the train was rerouted onto the old road and uh, hit debris at the Hazen Road. And, uh, 50 people died as a result. Um, but in the 1920s, um, you see that we start to see that the family auto really start to seriously compete with the uh, rail and the roads are improved. But nevertheless, you know, that they, they, they it's, it's got a long ways to go before, uh, you know, uh, rail is, is going to take 
play second fiddle to the car, but it's going to come. Um, 70 mile an hour speed limit now on the cutoff. Um, this is about the charter. The next one is a charter train. This is the one that rock, um, the Rockport wreck uh, from Chicago that's um, with the German um, folks who are going to be visiting Germany. Um, most of whom actually, actually met, end up getting on a ship that uh, the following morning, amazingly enough. Um, during the 20s, they start favoring Blairstown in terms of the number of trains that stop. Um, the water gap uh, hotels pretty much have um, gone under. There's almost nothing, I think nothing left for the most part. And um, the 1920s don't end well. Uh, we'll start with the Depression. 1930s and uh, it hits the, the rail industry very hard <coughs> and some of the things that happened specifically with the cutoff uh, or Port Morris the LCL the Western Carload facility at Port Morris closes they tear out a couple of sidings um, Greendale Tower is closed in the mid 30s there just really wasn't justification for it uh, the train, uh, the, the railroad does experiment with uh, innovative things such as the, the rocket where they speed up the, uh, you know, the schedule for that. Uh, speed limit on the cutoff is raised to 75. There was a train mm -hmm. coming up at uh, what at that point was West. Well, I'm not sure if it had a name actually in these days because Westport Morris actually was located on the, uh, uh, the other end of uh, Port Morris Yard. But this is where the third track uh, started, um, going into uh, into Port Morris. Your uh, County Road six hundred two. So during the forty, you see, nineteen forties, there is a surge of uh, traffic, um, having to do with uh, the U.S. is involved in World War II. By that time, Greendale is almost basically officially a, a freight only station, and Johnsonburg. I think a couple of trains might stop there on flag, but um, it's very sparse, very difficult. Um, Jerry Cruz said his, his mom somehow managed to commute from Johnsonburg in the 1940s, but it was tough. There were only a couple of trains which stopped. Already talked about the collapse of Armstrong Cut. Speed limit on the cutoff raised to 80, uh, but westbound only. And we see dieselization occurring during the late 40s. And, um, and also, eventually, we see the, the Phoebe Snow um, inaugurated in 1949. So in the 1950s, um, this isn't Route 80 at this point. This is Route 611, where, where today's Route 80 is. But this is uh, where it goes under the cutoff in the Delaware River Viaduct. <clears throat> So during the 50s, Blairstown becomes the only active passenger station on the cutoff. Uh, freight does continue on all, at all three stations. Um, Slayford Tower closed. Hurricane Diane decimates the railroad and basically creates the need for a merger, which the Lackawanna would prefer to have merged with the nickel plate, but okay. ends up uh, with the, uh, instead of an end at end, side to side with uh, the Erie. We talked about the runway and then the, the, the cut off the single track in 1958. So we move into the 60s here off of Roseville Tunnel. The Lackawanna merges with the Erie on October 17th of 60, um, although there will be official changes that drag on into 1961. Uh, former Erie management pretty much dominates the new railroad, uh, the Erie Lackawanna, and most of the freight is moved from the Lackawanna side to the Erie side. Uh, the Phoebe Snow is discontinued, then it's revived in 63, and then is discontinued again in 66. Um, a few passenger trains still remain past that time um, into the late 60s. Um, the severing of the Booten line, however, near uh, Patterson to create uh, the right of way for I-80 uh, will cause problems and that will come back to haunt the, the EAL when they switch the, um, the freights back to the, the Lackawanna side. So the Freedom Train, American Freedom Train coming through 
um, on the cutoff. The last passenger train on the cutoff, Lake Cities, stops at Blairstown. Um, EL becomes part of Derrico um, because of Hurricane Agnes. Um, until about 74, uh, virtually then all freight is shifted back to the Lackawanna side. It causes challenges because the, 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 well, because uh, of the, the Greenwood Lake branches um, and even I think the Booten line, much of that is, has been single tracked, I believe, if memory serves. And as a result, you, you know, you have operational issues with uh, running trains, but they somehow soldier through it. Um, there's actually a thought about um, somehow downgrading the Erie side and then uh, creating a, a, a connection between the cutoff and the Lehigh and Hudson River. It's a non-starter, but it was looked into by, by management. Um, it did not happen. Interesting proposal, but it just didn't happen. And then um, EL becomes part of Conrail in uh, 1976. And we know about the American Freedom Train, which comes uh, during Conrail times. Here's the uh, Amtrak special, November 13th, 1979. Um, Conrail, there's mixed messages. They originally up, they throw ballast down. They do a lot of work on the cutoff. But two years later, they're doing their darndest to get rid of, well, not just the cutoff, but the whole entire Scranton side or Scranton, um, basically, division. Um, by actively discouraging freight customers. Um, last car, we believe, was delivered to Greendale in 1978. Uh, the last through freight was November 78. Port Morris Tower officially closes in January. It's either the fourth or fifth, or fifth, I think, of uh, 79. There's actually sabotage of uh, the signal system on the cutoff is uh, reported. And then Amtrak runs uh, Hoboken Scran because in those days that's where uh, trains originated. Um, and really, that's I, I, I personally consider that the beginning of the 40 year effort to uh, reestablish passenger service on the line, 1979, November 13th. So, this is what uh, the cutoff becomes at that point after the, uh, the tracks are removed. But before that happens, there's abandonment. And um, <clears throat> Conrail moves against, um, you know, basically the, the, the line. The counties in New Jersey and Pennsylvania <clears throat> fight hard to save it. Uh, successful in Pennsylvania, but not in New Jersey. Um, there is some good news. Steamtown comes to Scranton in 1984. But, um, and the, the track ultimately on the Pennsylvania side, which is 60 miles worth, is, is saved. And then the cutoff is sold to the two different developers, who I mentioned, Mr. Turco and Mr. Romer. There's Mr. Turco. It's not really Mr. Turco, but uh, this is a, a pretty good facsimile, I'll say, Mr. Turco. Um, Turco actually threatens to destroy the cutoff by selling off fill, such as the Pequest fill, and dumping debris into the cuts on the, uh, the cutoff. Uh, Goldmeyer has less ambition about his. He wanted to use his section as an access road. Um, this is acts as an impetus for the to push the state of New Jersey to acquire the cutoff, and the bond issue is passed by the voters overwhelmingly, and that provides twenty five million for the acquisition of abandoned rail rights away, most of which which will go to the cutoff. By the way, so here's nineteen ninety. Here's that grade crossing again. Um, at County Road 602. Uh, this, this, uh, this signal will go to, uh, to Whippany, by the way. So um, condemnation is uh, initiated. Grade crossings in set uh, 602 and 611, which is Greendale, and the, uh, the bridge is torn down at uh, Slayford. Uh, 1995, MPS takes over operations at Steamtown. 97, <coughs> Amber Mills, a major flower producer, <coughs> opens in Mount Pocono. Um, there are snags in the condemnation process, <coughs> including exhaustion of the 25 million, which delays the acquisition. So 
This is uh, County Five, County Road Five Twenty One in Blairstown. So the cutoff is uh, acquired by DOT in two thousand one. Uh, the orphan bridges, as they're called, in uh, Blairstown and Byram Township are preserved. We get a FONSI, finding of no significant impact uh, for the environmental assessment. That's a big deal. This opens the door to federal funding for the minimum operating segment from Port Morris to Andover, 7.3 miles for New Jersey Transit. Uh, federal funds are approved for that about $62 million, including $24 million for Roseville Tunnel. And, uh, we talk about the Indiana bat, but it's really not a big issue. Well, here is the 2010s. So clearing the right-of-way begins. Uh, the track is delivered. 100th anniversary of the cutoff. This is uh, John Willover and I went to uh, Port Morris for the... Um, we missed, the first train would have come through at 4 a.m. on the, in 1911, we got, got here at uh, 10 a.m. So um, we missed it by six hours. So uh, as of this date, about 3.7 miles of track have been laid. They were, that was completed by March of 2012. So it's been three well, it's in three disconnected sections, but it's been 10 years since that any work has been done. And environmental issues have been resolved. Uh, Roseville Tunnel is ready for rehabilitation. And um, let's move on. And then we move on to the 2020s and Amtrak. <coughs> this is their map. You can see the stations on the line that they're proposing. Uh, in 2020, Amtrak announces plans for Scranton, New York City service. Uh, New Jersey Transit work on Port Morris Andover is uh, scheduled to resume shortly. And uh, we hope that by 2026, we'll see the running of the first passenger trains that are cut off in over half a century. And now we go into the, the future where we have the question marks. Um, will we get funding for the rebuilding of the rest of the cutoff, 21 miles, 21.1 miles? Um, will there be New York City Scranton service? Uh, if there is, they're proposing three round trips a day, three hours and 25 minutes, similar to what the Phoebe Snow's uh, schedule was from Hoboken to Scranton. And the proposed stops will be near a Penn Station, of course, Newark Broad Street, Summit, Morristown, Dover, Blairstown, East Stroudsburg, Mount Pocono, or would it be Margaritaville? We don't know. Toby Hanna and Scranton. And then even going further into the future, possibility of extending Amtrak service. If it makes it to Scranton, you know, why not go to Binghamton or Syracuse or maybe the Southern Tier, Elmira Corning? Who knows? It's, we'll, we'll see. This is all, this is crystal ball stuff. And uh, I'll just we'll give one last plug to, to my videos. Um, they're roughly 50 some odd right now, including, well, this one, not yet. This will be coming. And uh, the Lackawanna Cutoff Historical Committee, we are devoted to, uh, to following what's going on with the cutoff. So please feel free to join. It is a private group. We will let you in, no problem. And uh, we also have a presence on uh, other forms of media. So thank you very much. Um, if there are any questions, I'll certainly be happy to entertain them. That's really Chuck, I've been monitoring. We have a, let me, let me go through the list here. Uh, I'll ask the questions that are directly related to the presentation first, and I'll hold off on the ancillary ones till afterwards. Uh, and then after I read these questions, we can open the floor to uh, questions from the audience. Okay. Let me scroll up here and start. I'm going to start at the top here. Uh, question from Dick Wenzel. Uh, if the cutoff is rebuilt and you plan to operate trains, is there enough capacity on the rail network east going to New York to operate an increased volume of trains without having to add additional track capacity? 
Well, at least initially, if they're talking three trains in each direction, I don't see that being an issue. Um, and given that they, we expect that the trains would be, we're going to guess, probably late morning, sometime late afternoon, and sometime in the evening, they're probably going to stay away from the, the rush hour, at least the, I'll say the inbound rush hour probably is not going to be a problem with the con any kind of conflict. So I guess the bottom line, the short answer, at least in the beginning, I don't see three trains in each direction adversely affecting uh, the ability to, let's say, run in and out of Penn Station, New York, for example, which is really the limiting factor because of the number of, of uh, you know, spots, you know, the, where you can, you know, those you can bring trains in and out of the uh, Penn Station. But um, long-term, we'll see, but I think in short-term, uh, not an issue. Okay. Uh, next is actually a comment from Michael Eggleston. Uh, my mother and I took the trains from Binghamton to Hoboken in 1964 and 1965 to visit the New York World's Fair. I was 15 at the time, had a great ride over the cutoff, beautiful views, well, smooth, maintained track. Uh, okay. Let me see here. Next question uh, or a comment from Fred Heilick. Blairstown had east and west water, east and west water cranes on the, their sidings. Uh, Charles Bouchong asks, wouldn't the rock, wouldn't the rock still preclude daylighting the tunnel, which I think you sort of addressed already? Yeah, but it's a moot point. This, this given that the historic aspect has been determined, <clears throat> so it's it's not, it, there's no way it won't happen. Uh, Joseph Smith asks: Is the Delaware River Viaduct still structurally sound? Um, I'm not a civil engineer. Uh, they have estimated. They did a study in late 2019. And they estimated the cost of rehabilitating the Delaware River Viaduct at $54 million. So um, that suggests that there's some major work that needs to be done. Whether that makes it structurally unsound, I, I can't say. But the, the, I think that that would be the plan. They're not going to open the line without doing that, you know, some, some major restoration work. Okay. Uh, there's a question regarding the one photo. Um, of Route 611 going under the Delaware River Viaduct. And the question was, Route 611 or 46? I thought 611 was always on the Pennsylvania side, to which Fred Heilich actually responded. It was 611 for several years. Right. Yes. Um, it bounced Jeff back Gabriel and asks, forth. Okay. Um, Jeff Gabriel asks, how many trains would originate in Andover daily when the commuter service starts? I assume they would be extensions of existing trains from Lake Apakonk to New York or Hoboken. We haven't gotten, a, I would say, a, a direct answer about that. I think originally going back to the, um, the environmental assessment was based on, and don't quote me, I think it was based on six or eight trains, but I, I, I don't know. Um, but the, that, that's correct. The plan would be that they would be extending trains rather than in essentially uh, you know, um, creating new trains. So you're not you're just talking about a train that's going further west, as opposed to um, you know creating a new train that didn't previously exist. Okay, uh, here are two questions I scribbled down during the course of the presentation um, uh, regarding Turco. One thing I always heard was that another reason Turco bought the cutoff was to take the fills down and use it for the proposed Westway Highway project in New York City. Uh, it's, it's, true urban was that? It, it's true, but by the time he acquired it, Westway was dead, but there were other projects which would re have required um, some kind of fill. And so there would have been a market for it. Now, whether he was actually serious about it is not really clear. It's, I think at some point he realizes, I, I don't know when this occurs, but at some point, Turco kind of gets the idea that he's not going to win this if he's really serious about doing the, the removal of the fill and that maybe he can make some money. As it turns out, he makes a lot of money uh, for just keeping it and just selling it off to the state. Well, he doesn't sell it off. It gets condemned out from under him. But, um, but that's, that's how it ends up. 
Um, but yeah, there, but originally Turco may have been thinking about Westway, but Westway was really dead by the time he actually took possession of it. Yeah. Fred Heilick actually just commented, he said Warren and Sussex counties could have bought the uh, cutoff for $2 million before Tur Turco if they had wanted to do that. So just put some perspective in there, I guess. Um, yeah, well, lots of, you know, there's lots of, uh, you know, could have, would have, should have. <laughs> Uh, question I had, uh, when I, was, I started dating my wife, her aunt lived up in Johnsonburg, and I never really explored that area too much, and uh, this is back in 2000 about, uh, I found the Johnsonburg station site, um, I was exploring around there, at that time it didn't have a roof on it, it was just the concrete walls basically, and I thought, well, that's kind of sad, it's sitting there just, you know, slowly rotting away, and if few years later, I went up there and there's all sorts of construction being done. And they were putting a brand new roof on it. There's all new lumber. They're putting up new timber A-frames and such. I'm like, well, that's kind of unusual. And then a few years after that, like your picture showed, boom, gone. Um, was that kind of a, was, I'm not sure if this was before, uh, I'm not sure why that, why would that have been done? <coughs> that, was, that, that, was, that was Turco. Yeah, Turco uh, put Turco put the uh, roof back on after the fire to try and boost the value. And then the state wanted the creamery removed on the other side of the tracks. And they had a contract for that. And the contractor took the station out at the same time. Okay. I suspect it might have been a raise the cash value of the property thing by Turco. But I just want to confirm yeah, that he, the case. Tur okay. Tur Turco rebuilt uh, both Greendale and... Johnsonburg. Um, Greendale, we still had the same roof that, that Turco put on, uh, thankfully. Uh, so you must have, but that would have been like 1990, because he was told to cease and desist very early on, um, because um, it wasn't far into the 90s that he had, he had put in like windows, um, you know, it basically refurbished. But to, to Fred's point, it was, we think, was for the, just to up the, you know, the the, the worth of, or, you know, the, the value of the, the property. Um, but it, it was, well, anyway, it, 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 in the case of at Johnsonburg, it was, it turned out to be a waste. Fortunately, Greendale, it's, it really was a blessing that he, uh, that he put that roof on. At least we have a roof. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Jennifer's iPad. Uh, is there any chance Port Morris Tower will be restored? I, I don't know um, the, who would restore it and what would it be used for. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, uh, and that would be, I guess that's, I don't know, that's technically DOT there, but uh, we had a hell of a time getting a lease for the station at Greendale from DOT. So, um, uh, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, if some, if a group would come in and try to, um, to to restore it, um, of course the problem would be what would you use it for? But if, and would they allow you on site there? I don't know. Um, so I, I basically the the bottom line is I I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what else to tell you. Hey Paul, a curious thing was that uh, there was a design for a station at Andover back in uh, 1911, and uh, Johnsonsburg was to have the biggest station of the three that were built. And they scrapped that in February, 1911. And Johnsonsburg and Greendale were uh, identical stations in design. Fred, where would that station have been built, the proposed Andover one? I don't know. I uh, <coughs> you have a copy of the, uh, the roustabout and it has a uh, um, Bunnell's drawing of uh, where it was gonna be. It was probably gonna be up somewhere around Roseville uh, Road. Okay. Yeah. They, well, it, 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 it turned out that they, I, I believe that that station was going to be on the, the Sussex branch. And the problem there was that the, the people in Andover didn't know when to, to basically stop. And they really ticked off Truesdale and Truesdale basically yanked the whole thing. And they ended up with their, their shack that they had. They never, I don't think there was ever any intention that they'd get a, a station on the cutoff, but they, um, 
they were going to get a, a new station on the, the Sussex branch, and they, well, they ended up with nothing, as it turned out, because they they pissed off uh, Truesdale. Basically, <laughs> I think is what happened. At least they're reading the correspondence. He wasn't happy with them at all. And that's the last question we had about the presentation. There's one question, which I'll answer quickly. The question regarding the uh, convention, uh, what hotel is being used for the convention? Uh, I don't think there's, I'm not sure if there's a single host hotel and extra hotels for extra space. Um, I don't think it's been finalized, but I think the thought was there's going to be three different hotels you can choose from. Some are less than the others, but it gives you a range of price options. Um, but again, that's still being finalized, and those details will go out when the flyer goes out. Uh, if anyone has any other questions of the presentation, uh, you can unmute and ask. Otherwise, I think that's all. Um, Chuck, if you have any other final words, um no i just want to thank you for the invite um hope you enjoy the presentation uh we will see there's going to be this is uh, <laughs> the, the, the final chapter of this book is not yet written paul a quick uh, quick comment the uh the tunnel in the hainsburg had only tracking at one time and that's when the uh they were doing the tunnel work on the cutoff and that was originally the um the Lehigh in New England had track along what's now 94 for their pushers, but it never went through the tunnel. And the original survey for the Boston and South Mountain, that's why they had to put the tunnel one. Yeah, that was put in to preserve the right of way in case they chose to put in their own line instead of using right. the track and transfer at the Susquehanna. Uh, a lot of compliments in the uh, chat. Uh, everyone seems to have enjoyed it. And I thought that was a very well done presentation. I will give you, Chuck. Chuck's, YouTube, uh, with Chuck's YouTube channel another plug. Really good content on there. Really well produced. Like I said, you're going to spend a lot of time on there. And you'll get pulled in because a lot there's some really great interviews in there, too, as Chuck mentioned, with uh, Jerry Cruz and um, Artie Erdman, among others. I have uh, Faber also interviewed, which... He yeah. was you know, a challenge. I'll put it that way. But uh, I did. I did Tabor, um, and I enjoyed lot, every second of every session. Well, thank you. <laughs> a lot of good content. If you haven't seen it, search YouTube for it. Um, it it's well worth your your time. Uh, I guess that's it for tonight. Thanks everyone for for coming. Um, well, thank you. We'll be now that things are opening up from COVID. We'll be finally doing in-person meetings, but we're still going to be doing the virtual meetings as we get content. Uh, again, if anyone's interested in a presentation, reach out to myself or Jeff Gabriel, um, and we can help you set that up. But I think uh, that's it for tonight. Uh, thanks for coming, and uh, have a good night, everyone. Thanks a lot, Chuck. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to Chuck again. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. Welcome.